Welcome everyone. Uh, we still have some people entering the room, but we have a great turnout for today. Thanks everyone for joining in uh, for this topic that I think has got great interest. And so we have, um, just gonna give a brief overview. Um, nice to meet everybody. I'm uh, Matt Pritchard. I'm the president of the AGU Geodesy section. I'm just gonna give a brief overview before we get started here as we um, still are welcoming people into the session here. So uh, again, our Topic today is uh, growing and broadening the geodesy workforce. Um, we are really focusing today on uh, United States. We're hoping that maybe in future uh, webinars and definitely at the AGU meeting coming up in December, we'll be sort of focusing beyond that. But due to time zone constraints and so forth, we really have speakers focusing on the US here today. Um, I just wanted to give you a little brief overview of this webinar series. So we've been having this webinar now, we're in our third year we really have focused in recent years on uh, webinars featuring um, geodesy research from early career um, scientists. And so we have several uh, webinars that are now available on YouTube that you can go and watch. Um, and we're still open for nominations for early career speakers for the upcoming uh, year. So please feel free to contact me or um, other members of the geodesy uh, section leadership about that. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, in the AGU Geodesy section, we have about uh, 3,000 primary and secondary members. About 60% of those are from the United States. Of that group, about um, 400 are student members. That's graduate student and undergraduate students, uh, with about 100 of those being uh, primarily interested in geodesy as their primary section. So we have um, uh, a lot of members in this organization, and I think they're very interested in this topic. Um, and they also have many ties to different other um, areas of the earth sciences that sort of list here sort of spanning all different parts of AGU. Uh, motivation for today's webinar is I think uh, familiar with many people there have been uh, there was a report written last year um, on sort of a uh, crisis in geodesy that was picked up by several uh, publications in terms of uh, having a workforce. And so I'm just citing a few of these publications here, but that's sort of part of the background for just talking about what efforts are already underway in a variety of different areas uh, that we'll hear from our speakers today. I did say that after I sent out this announcement for the webinar, somebody pointed me back to this uh, Life Magazine article uh, from 1958, uh, sort of talking about a geodesy crisis that sort of existed around the time of Sputnik. Um, just noting the point that we sort of seem to go through these cycles and uh, we have uh, confronted the, the cycle um, in the last century and hopefully we can address it again in the coming century. All right, so without further ado, um Matt, you hit your, Matt, you hit your mute button. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Donna, for letting me know that. So um, that, that was me. I was trying to click on admit and accidentally, you know, hit Matt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now this is the problem with giving you co-host uh, responsibilities, John. <laughs> Thanks for noticing, Donna. I could have talked for quite a while without anyone telling me. So um, anyway, so here are our speakers today. I want to get started. Um, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves so that we can sort of move along. Um, the first uh, groups of speakers will each give 15 minutes and then we'll have sort of 10 minutes for the last two. We'll save all questions for the end. Um, you should all be muted during the, the presentations here and then we'll sort of open up, unmute everybody. We'll open up the chat. So feel free to save your questions uh, for the end. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and hand this over to Nikki. Wow, good morning all, good afternoon, good evening. Um, as humanity, I think we're going to have to find some uh, way to, to get a better greeting as we uh, leverage all of this technology, but uh, whatever time zone you're in, welcome. Um, as noted, I'm Dr. Nikki Markiel. I am a member of the Defense Intelligence Senior Leadership, and I am currently posted as the Senior Geoin Authority for Geomatics at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And NGA is a little bit of a unique agency. We're actually dual-hatted as both an intelligence agency as well as a combat support agency. And in the latter role in particular, we provide a lot of 
support for the Department of Defense across the broad range of activities that they do, which basically boils down that at the end of the day, I am a geodesist and I get to work with a whole lot of people in mapping and charting and geodesy uh, to support uh, the DOD as well as the nation as a whole. And in that role, I am often asked what my number one concern is. And don't get me wrong, uh, I have a lot of different concerns, but always number one at the top of the list is a question of where are we going to get the next generation of talent from? And uh, this is not just geodesy, although we're going to focus obviously today on geodesy, but across the board, if we talk about acoustics, we talk about photogrammetry, we talk about sonar, we can go all the way down the long laundry list. If we look at things, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, Currently in the United States, according to NIST, uh, or I should say the National Science Foundation, 79% of all of the computer programmers and 81% of all the electrical engineers are not U.S. citizens. And that's a real problem for us because obviously as a DOD entity, we not only have a challenge in recruiting STEM writ large, but on top of that, they need to be U.S. citizens uh, in addition. And so that fundamental question of where we're going to get people, but in particular geodesists, is a real concern. If we look at the disparity overall, folks, according to the World Economic Forum, China has roughly 4.7 million STEM graduates age 18 to 60. The, uh, India is in second place at about 2.6 million. The U.S., according to their World Economic Forum reporting, is a distant third at 568,000. I imagine there's a lot of scientists on board right now on this channel. Congratulations, on average, you're outnumbered nine to one. But if we start talking about geodesy, that swells to a 78 to one disparity. Um, and that's a real problem. And <clears throat> the fundamental reality is, is we're losing the war for brains and we're going to have to change. A great example, and Matt, I know you threw up a couple of examples of GPS. I don't think a lot of folks always understand the relationship between a lot of the science that geodesists do and something that we increasingly just take for granted, which is GPS. But you've got precision atomic clocks. Well, two atomic clocks do not tick at the same rate if they're not sitting on the same equipotential, the same gravity surface. So there's an inherent relationship between gravity and time right at the very beginning. You have the whole gravitational field. So how is that perturbing those GPS satellites as they orbit about so that we can get at that precision geolocation for those birds? The magnetic field, so they know how to orient their solar panels to the sun and remain charged up and operational. And then the whole broad range of the reference frames that underpin uh, position as a whole, both the celestial and the terrestrial reference frame, in our case, World Geodetic System 1984, and the earth orientation parameters that uh, go ahead and support all of that. So this is just one exemplar of how there's a broad range of the science which has been built up and we have taken for granted for a great number of years. The fundamental reality is that many of our current GEOINT professionals retire out. There really isn't enough young professionals behind them that are ready to step up and take their place. And not only that, we have, as I fundamentally say, a real marketing problem. Um, I've consistently said for many, many years, we do not have a STEM problem in the United States. We have a fundamental marketing problem because the reality is, is that far too many don't even know that the field of geodesy exists, why it's important. And as a result of that, we not only risk the loss of the expertise that we need, but we find that the academic programs are equally at risk. And that puts an impact not only to the next generation, but the generations to come. Who's going to be there to educate the next generations uh, of, of geodesists and geodematics professionals as they come? Now, to cope with this, I can say that at least at, at NGA, as well as I know several other federal agencies, we have resorted to hiring people with degrees in math and physics. And then we send them off to school in order to become and transform themselves into geodesists. And I'm very grateful for that. 
It, it's an arduous process. It's certainly not easy. And yet at the same time, it takes away from their ability to support the missions at hand today. Um, and so that is really not a sustainable effort as we look to how to advance forward. And advance forward, we really must. Um, if we look even beyond the aspects of GPS and really just a couple of quick vignettes to think through, um, self-driving vehicles, okay? What are the accuracy requirements gonna need to be? What's the reference frame need to be? How do we accurately geoposition those kinds of platforms so that we can reliably and safely drive a vehicle at 70, 80 miles an hour down a freeway and, and do so in a safe and reliable manner? Uh, if we look at things like drone deliveries, you know, how do we make sure that, you know, the pizza company delivering your your pizza tonight via drone delivery knows where your house is, but equally knows how to position and how to get there. And if we look to even more broader aspects like space and the whole Artemis mission and man's uh, efforts to reach out to the stars, you know, how are we going to do fundamental time in space it is a real ongoing challenge and how to do so in an effective manner. So these are just a couple of examples of the challenges that are, are there to come. But really to advance our economy, to improve our lives and to maintain fundamentally again, our national security, we have to be the world's leader in geodesy as a whole that underpins our very well way of life. Um, all of this geodesy is not only just underpinning GPS, it actually winds up underpinning about 16 components of U.S. national infrastructure, banking, finance, Wall Street, the electrical grid, the transportation grid, the communications grid that we're leveraging right now with our digital communications, that and all much more. We're going to need the people who can not only maintain the science today, but also develop and manage cutting edge methods and technologies. We need people to be studying it. I truly believe and have made the statement that if we do not quadruple the number of STEM graduates in this country by 2035, that we are going to lose not only the global war for brains, but we're going to lose the ability to sustain our way of life as we know it. So how do we get there? The longstanding definition that I know of of insanity is to repeat the same behavior and anticipate a different outcome. And clearly I would submit whatever we have been doing over the last 20 to 30 years is not working. And to continue down that path is insanity. So I think it, first and foremost, we have to go back. We're all, many of us are scientists. Many of us are researchers. What does the research say? Well, let's focus first on why kids don't go to college. I'm not talking just about STEM. I'm just saying college writ large. Well, first and foremost, no member of their family has ever gone to college. They do not know what to expect. Again, that's a marketing problem. Number two, they don't think they're smart enough. That's a perception problem, not necessarily a reality. Number three, they don't know how to pick a school. Number four, they don't know how to pick a program. And way down the list at number five is the fundamental question of money. If we focus on why don't kids go into STEM, we find that the number one issue is, is they don't know the jobs exist. Again, it's that educational aspect of what is geodesy and why does it matter? That goes to the second issue that we wind up finding in the research, which is that there's a perception that working in STEM is boring. You just sit at a computer all day and that doesn't sound like much fun. So at the end of the day, the challenge I would submit is really threefold. Number one, we have to make them aware. We, we have to quit being introverted. We have got to get out. We've got to market and make them aware. Number two, we have to capture their imagination of the importance, the relevance, and the fantastic to pass.
Nikki, um, I can't hear you anymore. I don't know if, if the sound somehow, is anyone else having a problem hearing? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I think I think we've lost. Um, I see a frozen screen here. So I'm going to give it just a few more seconds, and maybe um, John and Rick, maybe you guys get on deck in case we um, need to switch over to you guys. All right, I don't quite know what happened there. So um, hopefully we'll be able to reconnect with Nikki here in just a second. But um, in the interest of keeping this flowing, I'm gonna just, maybe we'll return it to, if you guys are ready to go, John and Rick, um, I will let you guys go. Can you guys unmute yourselves? Okay, that looks good. Awesome. All right. So I will let, um, we'll hopefully return to Nikki a little bit later, but why don't you guys go ahead um, and so we can stay on schedule. Rick, go with the plan. You go first. <laughs> okay. Thanks, John. Uh, so I'm Rick Bennett, uh, currently at the National Geodetic Survey, uh, but um, up until just recently, I was also a professor at the University of Arizona for several years. And uh, I want to take just a slightly different uh, view on this topic, um, maybe from uh, uh, most others uh, today, uh, in that, you know, when I heard about this geodesy crisis issue, uh, I don't know, several months ago, uh, I began uh, talking with, you know, early career geodesy people, students, uh, people in their, their first jobs, and, um, and I got a kind of a consistent message back from them. Uh, about this topic, and it was something to the effect, uh, you know, or don't don't I count? Do I count? Like you know, uh, and so um, I thought about this for quite a bit. Uh, you know, a lot of people, particularly from you know my background, are coming through geosciences and they apply geodesy to problems that probably they initially got interested in: climate, earthquakes, tectonics, things like that. And then you know, geodesy is a tool for them. And so uh, uh, from that subset of people, some of them, you know, become uh, more attached to geodesy than others. But um, the, uh, the point is that, you know, there are a lot of people who use geodesy and have a, re a reasonable understanding of how ge geodesy works. And uh, I want to just say, you know, geodesy is sort of an onion, right? And there's many layers to peel back. And so... Uh, the, I have just two sort of simple messages. One uh, being for the more you know mid-career to senior career geodesists, uh, I, I want to encourage us not to use terms like real geodesist because that implies that there are things that are not real. There are geodesists who aren't real, fake geodesists, whatever that means. And it sends kind of a negative message to those young people who are using geodesy and might very well, you know, decide that at some point in their career they want to become, they want to peel back more layers of the onion and, and, and learn a little bit more about the fundamentals. And then uh, the only other real thing that I wanted to say was for the younger uh, early career uh, people who have some, you know, knowledge of geodesy, maybe many of you are here. Uh, don't, don't, if you identify yourself as a geodesist, you're a geodesist. Don't let anybody else tell you that you're not a real geodesist or that uh, somehow you have to meet some sort of threshold before you be considered a real geodesist. And like I said, the onion uh, analogy, uh, there may be layers of the onion you haven't yet peeled back, but uh, that's probably because you haven't needed them at this point in your career. And uh, so I, I just want to uh, let you know that there's nothing magical about peeling those layers back. It doesn't require some superpower. Uh, if you need them in the future, you can peel them back and, and learn what you need to know. And so um, uh, just want, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, in moving forward on this topic, 
we're not uh, discouraging people because they may feel like, well, I guess I'm doing it wrong or something to that effect. Uh, and I'll pass it on to John now. Thanks, Rick. Uh, give me a second to get, you know, my timer set up. Uh, if I don't do this, it, it, it will be trouble. Don't worry, John. I'll keep I'll keep on you. All right. Super. Hey, Matt, thanks for setting this up. And 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 thanks to folks like Mike Beavis and 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 uh, and Hinkley at at uh, at at National Forest Service, you know, to help I did, you know, uh, bring up this uh, this issue of the the geodesy crisis. But let me get my notes going here. Um, well, first, I want to uh, uh, first of all, yes, I I'm John Galetska. I've been at N National Geodetic Survey for about three and a half years now coming on as as the 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 Corps branch chief and 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 uh so yeah I'll that that's a quick intro there and uh, I I do want to start off by saying you know the 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 views I'm going to share with you are are my own they're not those of NGS or or, or NOAA or the federal government so all right that's out of the way so uh yes that there is definitely a geodesy crisis you know, if if John Galetska gets hired on to the uh, National Geodetic Survey as a geodesist and as Corps branch chief, that's a crisis. That I know there are way better people, smarter and and more energetic and more knowledgeable than than me. But for some reason, you know, they didn't step up, and 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 the folks at NGS who uh, hired me, well, you know, hats off uh, to them, but. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of amazing I'm here, and uh, I think it's through through just uh, uh, you know I I have a uh, I started off in 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 this 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 uh, journey in geodesy about in 1996. Uh, you know, I, I was uh, out of high school. I joined the army. Was in the army rangers for four years had the college funds coming to me and I thought, oh, I'll do something to keep me outside. I'll, I'll study geology. So went back to uh, Oregon, went to the University of Oregon, got a, a degree, a bachelor's in, in uh, geological sciences. And, and uh, I, I had a, a, a another great um, uh, American institution. I got a, an internship from uh, the, the National Association of Geology Teachers. I got an internship with the USGS, and instead of doing geologic mapping in, in Alaska and Montana, I get assigned to the Pasadena, uh, uh, California USGS field office, where in the aftermath of the Northridge earthquake, uh, they they needed help building the new the newly funded SIGN network, the, the Southern California Integrated GPS Network. So, so actually, I was brought on as a geologist and my title was geologist and and which I thought it was a little funny kind of doing geophysics and, and this GPS stuff but but uh yeah three months led to six years with the USGS and then I went on to Caltech to help them building cores networks and stations in Nepal and Tibet and Sumatra and stuff uh 13 years with uh Caltech and then jumping uh, jumping over to uh, UNAVCO, uh, helping them build a, a, a GPS meteorological network in in Mexico called Tlalocnet, and then and then uh, doing some other stuff for for UNAVCO, uh, maintaining and setting up stations in the Galapagos and in, in Tanzania, and then uh, and then in uh, just as as COVID was beginning, you know, I I I get this call from from folks at, at NGS saying I should apply for this job. Never thought I would get this this Corps branch chief job, but uh, I did. Put the big boy britches on, and and this is where I am. So I, I'm I'm really not the right person uh, uh, to for this, but I will just you know grit my teeth and and do the best job I can. So let me share some some observations, you know, uh, that that I have. So that that I that that are encouraging. So just recently, in in the last year, you know, I I, I personally see that the uh, that that the U.S. the federal government we're we're not 
coordinated in in geodesy you know uh, there are duplicate efforts there there's there are are things that uh, one group doesn't know about the other i just recently at a meeting i chaired not even the noaa space weather people who could easily benefit from cores data they had no idea that you know the noaa cores network existed so so anyway, it's it's encouraging to see that uh, uh, thanks to to the the the, the primary players and this new community of practice, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and and uh, my outfit, National Geodetic Survey, started this federal community of practice. In the recent uh, uh, months, NASA has has uh, been brought on as well as USGS. But we need uh, to expand it more. NSF is is a big player in this, and and heck, there are even minor players that that are dabbling in in geodesy now, like uh, National Park Service. So that that's a a, a great movement, and and uh, a federal player. You know, I just want to say that I I've seen some. I paid visit to USGS Golden a few weeks ago, and and met with some some new geodesists there. And just in, encouraged to see, you know, folks mm -hmm. like early career folks like Bill Barnhart, and I saw that uh, Dara Goldberg was was brought on. That is just awesome. That that's that's encouraging. So let's let's keep it up, Feds. Uh, Gage, the the Gage facility, uh, uh, you know, formerly run by UNAVCO and now taken on by uh, 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 the. The Gage facility is, has uh, the the geodetic facility for the National Science Foundation has merged together with the seismic facility, and they now call themselves the EarthScope Consortium. So I would say, you know, let's put in a bunch of chips with them. They do geodesy A to Z. You know, if you need, if the community needs to borrow equipment, they have it. If they need help building networks, they can do it. If if uh, they're also good with education and and outreach, and Donna will I'm sure will will speak to that. So let's let's you know keep uh, uh, they're a powerhouse. They're a full the Gage facility uh, of Earthscope is is a geodetic powerhouse. Let's support them. Um, moving on. Recently, this earlier this year, for it, it's. The NGS and you know NGS should have been doing this way back when, uh, you know, uh, twenty years ago. Uh, a mentor of mine, uh, uh, Duncan Agnew, you know, uh, he he was complaining it, uh, about the way NGS wa was or wasn't doing things, such as you know proper cores monumentation and and uh, and 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 maybe one thing that that's it, it you know, maybe. Maybe something that that's better late than never. But NGS earlier this year, you know, we we uh, 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 sent out this, uh, you know, asking, uh, uh, offering these, uh, 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 how are we calling it, geospatial modeling grants. And so out of that came four awardees: Michigan State University, Ohio State University, Oregon State University, and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So it, it is great, you know, NGS pumping money into the uh, 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 academic geodesy to, to, you know, to do problems that will help NGS move into the 21st century. So that, that's been a long time coming. That, that's an encouraging, uh, uh, that's encouraging uh, movement there. Um, Next thing, uh, just recently, you know, my my partner uh, uh, Will Freeman uh, here at uh, in in the uh, the spatial reference system division of of NGS, we've uh, been banging our heads against uh, the 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 our own contracting uh, uh, force within uh, uh, within NOAA, and finally, it it uh, we we uh, were able to award a contract for uh, a, a, a group to to build the next generation of what we are calling foundation cores uh, uh, federally NGS federally owned cores that will always be on will if if all the other NOAA cores network stations disappeared 
at least we'd have a backbone of federally owned stations to to carry on uh, uh, the 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 core's needs. So th this is I I kind of see it like a like a, a, a you know like a depression era of you know civilian conservation corps or or, or um, the a WAPA uh, program where we're building infrastructure that will last for decades and even centuries. So it's great that we got that award uh, uh, awarded and uh, for the next five years, pumping in millions of dollars into uh, this this much needed uh, uh, federal uh, geodetic infrastructure. So again, good. It, it's a, a good start. 30 then, seconds. Then, John, you got 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Perfect. So I'm just going to say, you know, within my own branch, you know, Ann Sheehan, uh, uh, asked me the other day, hey, how are we doing at NGS? Are you hiring enough women and and uh, minorities? I've got to say, yes, in my own branch, you know, six out of the 10 members are female and, you know, diverse, we, we different ethnicities. We're doing good. I'm going to try my best. Matt, over to you. Thanks so much, John and, and Rick. Um, and I think we have uh, Dr. Markiel back. So um, try to unmute you and give you your last five minutes here before we move on to Jeremy. All righty. Well, thank you. Technology is always wonderful when it works. Um, I, uh, I think the place where I dropped off, I was really starting to talk about the community as a whole and the aspects that we have to reach back, not only at graduation day, but all the way back down the K-12 chain. Because if we don't get them hooked by age 12, and this is, again, what the research shows, they're not going to be there at uh, graduation day for us to hire. But beyond that, I think one of the most important lessons we've learned is that it is a mistake to just focus exclusively on the students. That it is necessary, but not sufficient. Equally, you have to focus on the parents, the relatives, the friends. Very importantly, the teachers and the educators, the civic groups that surround those students and are going to be the powerful forces that make the decisions about how, what they want to do with their lives and what they want to do with a career. Um, it's all really about increasing the size of that hiring pool. Now, what we've really done is a, a series of programs that I'm just going to talk through very, very quickly. And they really basically boil down the first one called Geopathways, which breaks down at kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, we're trying to introduce them at the sixth through eighth grade level. It's about an immersion in the geoscience on the geospatial principles, including geodesy. And then Geo Impact is our program for the ninth through 12th graders that not only just provides some education, but also a geospatial certification that then postures them to be able to look at getting certain jobs throughout the geospatial and in, in the, the fields that we need to have. Um, and then most importantly, I think, is Geo Immersion. This is a program that we have stood up in partnership with our local universities, including our HBCUs and other minority serving uh, institutions in the community to particularly on the aspect of educators at all levels, but also those parents uh, that surround those students to educate them. We've held a whole series of educational courses on Saturdays, for example, about what is it we do and why does it matter and where does it have impact, um, not only just to those K-12 students, but again, to the parents that surround them. We've realized that that exposure is the absolute key. Uh, and as example, that whole program this year had over 200 students at various age group and levels that went through. And then we were able to leverage that, that we had 19 students this year, juniors and seniors in high school, that uh, we received some waivers. We were able to get them a security clearance at a secret no foreign level from the, uh, through the DOD and have them actually come in and work for us in addition to our broad coalition of, uh, of our normal college interns that we have. It's also about the partnership agreements with the University of Missouri, Harris State, and uh, that bridges to GeoSCON, which is our program that I mentioned to broadly look at how can we uh, in a consortium with our friends at NGS, with our friends at NOAA and others, 
to try to build long-term strategic research because, of course, research dollars is the lifeblood of, of particularly higher education and academia. But I do want to take the last couple minutes to highlight really, I think, two important issues that we need to focus on. And the first is since 2008, the U.S. birth rate is down 20 percent. If you do the math in your noggin, 2008 plus 18 is 2026, and those students would have normally otherwise been graduating college in 2030. And no matter what we do, we will be down a minimum of 20 percent because they had never been born in the first place. And that will continue for the next 20 years. So beyond the focus just exclusively on our K-12, we've realized that we're going to have to open up that aperture to the 25 to 55 year old cohort and see what can we do and get creative about enabling uh, some of these folks to think about a career change. And that means getting creative about what are really the minimum requirements? Does everybody necessarily right out of the gate need to have a four-year degree in geodesy? Or can we do certificates, stackable certificates that then wind up leading to those more advanced degrees that we uh, all need and need to have so that, but it's a way to facilitate uh, augmenting that, that workforce as a whole. But the second thing I really wanna focus on is our educators. And one of the major lessons we've learned is that it's not just enough to know how to teach the students for a successful future, but it's how to reach those students, particularly in underrepresented communities. And I really believe as a whole, we need to look at how we are leveraging math really at the end of the day, I would submit as a stratifying element in our schools, we need to commit to bringing math to everyone. It is a language, it is a facilitator, and not using it as a means to separate out the worthy and the unworthy for college, for STEM, and for viable careers. We're going to have to establish decadal-long research thrusts to develop a next generation of subject matter experts and integrate research, curriculum enhancement, and develop educators as a whole. Um, these efforts, all the way down through the K-12 chain, the GOSCon to augment and pump up our, our, our research initiatives. But I think most importantly, that focus holistically from K-12 on and the parents, that focus on opening that aperture and a focus, I think, really on revisiting how do we teach math in this country uh, are going to enable us to collectively find and implement the means to both foster STEM, foster geoint and develop our, the geodetic professionals that we need um, and replicate what we're doing on a national basis. So over to you, Matt, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Markiel. And Jeremy, if you could unmute yourself then you're ready to go. All right, thank you, Matt. And thank you everyone for joining the session today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Maurer and I am an assistant professor at Missouri S&T in Rolla, Missouri. I'm gonna pull my slides up here. Can you guys see that okay? Looks great. All right, thanks. So um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about a project that I've been thinking about uh, since the white paper came out uh, last year, I think it was January, 2022. And I know I have a crazy uh, title for my slide, uh, so bear with me and I will explain everything. Um, but before I jump in, I wanna give a shout out to the other uh, folks, collaborators and colleagues of mine that are on this uh, project. You can see their names there on the slide uh, and especially Justin Garcia, uh, who is our creative team lead. And I think a number of these folks are, are in the audience today. So really appreciate all of them. So, and I really uh, wanna thank Nikki for really setting me up very well um, because that's exactly what I was gonna say. There's really, I think as we, I've, I've thought about this and talked to others and heard others, there's really three aspects to this problem. We're trying to think about how do we draw students in? How do we get people interested in the field of geodesy? And there's these three aspects that we have to sort of deal with. One is an awareness problem. So students need to know that we exist and that it even like, what geodesists do, what is geodesy? Um, there's an interest problem. So if students aren't interested or if what we do seems, and again, it's not, not that this is reality, but just a perception. Uh, if what we do seems boring, then students won't come, they'll go to other places. Um, and then opportunity, if there's no viable or visible career path for them to follow, no, um, whether that uh, seems societally relevant or te technologically relevant, students will look elsewhere. 
Um, and this was really kind of encapsulated actually in the white paper itself that came out last year. And I've actually got a quote here that I thought I would just read a little bit from. Uh, we believe that to reverse the U.S. collapse in genetic capacity, it will be necessary to engage in. Uh, and then the authors actually go into three different modes, three kind of uh, marketing schemes, if you will, for how to bring people into the field. And their first mode is given here, uh, a general education outreach and mass recruitment effort aimed at thousands and eventually tens of thousands of mostly young people that describe the fascinations of our discipline, the adventures of genetic fieldwork, and the career opportunities available to suitably trained individuals. So there you see those three things. We need to make students, especially young people, aware of geodesy as a field, get them interested in the field, show them the career opportunities that are there. And you'll notice that there's this emphasis on younger folks. And I think uh, the other uh, speakers have touched on this as well. And this is really key because as has been said already, students are making decisions. They're thinking about what they wanna do when they grow up all the way back into middle school and high school. And certainly all of us know in high school, you're deciding about majors and colleges and careers. Uh, but even as far back as middle school, you're thinking about, again, what do I wanna do when I grow up? What is the path that I'll need to take to get there? So to address this specific demographic, uh, this middle to high school range and even into college and, and parents, someone mentioned parents and that I think is also key. What we've done is to propose that we develop an, an all new animated comedy about the world of geodesy. And the idea here is to actually create a, a series. Uh, so like a TV show kind of format where we'd have a number of uh, episodes talking about what geodesists do, different geodetic topics. It would star uh, our alien uh, geodesist, uh, and he has to work with a cocky, kind of privileged college student, and they have to learn to get along, work together, learn about geodesy in order to save the planet that they are working on and living on. Now, why would I propose to you, and I, I see a lot of my colleagues and friends in the audience, so I hope I haven't lost all my credence now, um, but why would I propose such an interesting idea? Well, if you look at kind of mainstream entertainment, uh, mainstream TV networks have been using entertainment to educate kids for years. Uh, so you think about PBS Kids and all the shows that they have put out. Uh, entertainment has been used to educate kids at a very early age for years. It's not something which is, uh, which is that new. And there's actually a really interesting and uh, in, uh, fun example in the UK. There's a UK organization called Get Kids Into Survey. This is focused on surveying. Um, and what they have done is they've put together a series of posters, which kind of shows you know, what surveying is about, what kind of exciting problems you get to work on. And they've actually done a comic book. So they have characters and a storyline and kind of some mystery to solve. And according to the organization, they've actually been very successful at reaching thousands of kids in the kind of elementary age range with this message about getting into surveying. So we're thinking about targeting a little bit older demographic, kind of middle to high school range. And so what we've done is taken a cue from mainstream entertainment. Uh, so Gravity Falls that you see here on the right, this was an animated comedy, which was very popular with middle and high school kids and also adults. So the whole demographic there uh, you can get. And what are the keys to doing that? One is sophisticated humor. So as kids start to get older, they become more interested in comedy. And the great thing about that is, is that comedy appeals to not just middle and high school kids, but also to their parents. So all the way from middle school up to adults, you're bringing people and getting people interested. And then the other is serialized storytelling. So this is not just a one and done deal, but it's something which is kind of ongoing, keeps people coming back to see what happens next. And that actually increases your retention and engagement in the, in the content. So there are some benefits to using entertainment to, to reach this demographic. One is that it works. Comedy is an immensely popular subset of entertainment, and it's very highly effective at reaching broad audiences. And also, I want to point out that it's actually been shown in the research um, that it's been very effective at reaching diverse audiences where other more traditional educational uh, methods have not done as well. Entertainment is synergistic. It can and should, I think, be coupled with all of the more traditional educational outreaches that we've been talking about, um, K through 12 education, uh, college degree programs, and so on, in order to maximize the impact. And we actually um, have a proposal together to do this, and that's exactly what we said we would do, is develop the show and then develop educational materials that accompany that uh, to maximize that impact. Entertainment is engaging, so it's not just uh, someone giving a lecture or someone talking, but you can tell all kinds of interesting stories, uh, even fictional stories, while at the same time having a very realistic portrayal of geodesy, geodetic tools, and the kind of career paths that geodesists have. And it can be ongoing, again, sort of taking a cue from mainstream entertainment, 
you can have branding, you can have spinoffs, you can even have merchandising, and all of that sort of builds the impact of the content. So there's some benefits. There's also some challenges. Uh, a number of challenges. One of those is that it's very expensive. So television production of any kind is extremely costly um, if it's done well. And that's the second challenge, which is that it must be done well. You all know we are all inundated with entertainment options and content options all the time, uh, whether that's online or on TV. And so in order to really make sure that we're engaging students, uh, it has to be really well done. And this kind of leads into the third challenge, which is that geodesy is a very technical field. And oftentimes, uh, you know, comedy is not all that technical, right? So putting together a, a, a show which has both the a really high quality entertainment, really high quality uh, comedy aspect to it, and has that really high quality portrayal of geodesy um, is really key and important to, to making this work. Uh, and I'll just pause here for a moment and say the, the folks that were on the first slide that I showed, I think we've been able to put together uh, really just all the key pieces in order to be able to make this work. Um, and it's been my privilege to work with all those guys uh, and gals uh, to see this thing uh, come about. So just to conclude, um, I think we definitely need to raise awareness of geodesy in this demographic, middle school, high school, and going into college. This is the age when kids are deciding, what do I want to do when I grow up? Comedy and entertainment are highly effective methods of reaching these specific demographics. So I think it's something we should definitely be thinking about. Uh, and then so to bring it all around, joking about geodesy, uh, not to say that uh, we're not serious um, in what we do. We do a lot of regular research, uh, very serious about that. But bringing out the lighter side, showing folks a little bit about the lighter side of the field, hopefully to help get them interested, get them uh, attached to the idea of doing geodesy as a career should be, I think, one crucial component. It's not the whole answer. It's part of a multi-pronged effort um, to really bring people into the geodesy field, coupled with more graduate programs and undergraduate programs and K through 12 uh, educational things. Um, so that is all I have and I will give it back to Matt. Great, thanks so much, Jeremy. All right, so our last speakers today will be uh, Donna and Michael, if you guys are ready to uh, share your screens. Great, and can you unmute yourselves? Yes, I can. <laughs> Years of Zoom and this and yet. <laughs> um, okay, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Um, we're really happy to um, to be able to to speak with you all and and I think that I would like to say to you know yes to everything everybody said up to this point. Um, I am uh, Donna Charlevoix. I am the vice president of engagement for Earthscope Consortium. And I'm tag teaming this um, presentation with Michael Hubenthal, who is a program manager of education and workforce. And so we would like to um, kind of share with you the things that we've done that have been successful, but really emphasize on some of the future. So um, Michael. Sure. So just to give a little bit of background, um, a number of you are probably familiar with um, let maybe less familiar with Earthscope and a little more familiar with some of our, um, uh, our organizational past. So UNAVCO and IRIS are maybe two organizations that you've heard of previously. As of January of this year, so 2023, we had a corporate merger between the IRIS Consortium and UNAVCO uh, to form the new Earthscope Consortium. And the Earthscope Consortium is the operator of both the GAGE and SAGE uh, facilities for the National Science Foundation. So as you can see, the GAGE is the geodetic facility for the National Science Foundation. And we have support also from NASA and USGS as part of that. Stage similarly is, uh, is focused more on seismology, but um, these are now combined um, uh, 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 under one operator, but two separate facilities um, that we're using to continue to serve uh, outwork focused on Earthscope um, related science and uh, education and workforce materials. So as Donna said, we want to yeah. focus on some of the successes that we've had and then maybe transition into opportunities. Yeah, I, uh, thanks, Michael. The the Gage facility, um, you know, and and the Sage facility, in some in some way, have been around for almost forty years, and so there's been a lot of work over that time. Um, more recently, there's been a, a pretty big effort on education and outreach and workforce. 
Um, I've been working in this space um, with the Gage facility for about 10 years. And even over that 10 year period, the evolution of how we're trying to reach uh, new audiences and how we're trying to engage with students and faculty and, um, and the next generation of jihadists has really changed. And I see it actually changing even more. Um, you know, a lot of people talked about many different aspects of things. And I will say that as a facility exists, in case you're not aware, the facility exists to help facilitate the science and the education. Um, but we also have a really strong workforce component. We actually have staff whose full-time job is to do geo workforce. And what does that mean? It means that their job is to help recruit and train and launch the next generation of, of scientists um, into geodesy or seismology and so forth. So the important thing I think for people to know is that we this is this is people's full-time job here and we really want to work with all of you in order to um, to help advance forward uh, you know the the this initiative. We've done for years we've done geodetic training and, and processing. Uh, which is critical for any geodesist who wants to look at data, you have to know how to process it. Those courses have evolved over the years, but they are a mainstay um, and they're very important uh, because we need data in order to do things, um, to do the science. We engage with uh, faculty and that is university faculty and K-12. And this ranges from everything to exposing them to geodesy, to, um, having short courses where we take them out in the field and we help them learn how to use different geodetic equipment that they can then take back into their own classrooms. And then we have a lot of student engagement and this ranges um, by by type of engagement and, and level, um, K-12 all the way up to postdocs. We have mentoring programs. We um, about five years ago launched a thing called Career Circles which were informal discussions um, for students where we bring somebody in talking about their career path and it allows students opportunities to ask questions. So somebody mentioned that this is really important. Students don't know that geodesy is a career. I'll be honest, I'm not trained as a geodesist. I'm trained as an atmospheric scientist and I didn't know anything about geodesy before I came. And that's a big problem because I was in the scientific field, I was in the physical sciences, and yet this was not visible to me. So our approach is to uh, engage students who may express an interest in geoscience and then give them more information about geodesy and how they may use it. Um, and you can see some of the photos here. Um, we have instituted a, a one of our internships, we have many, we have five. One of our internships is a workforce focused internship and some of these folks that are in the photo are actually now uh, working in the federal government in geodesy or, or in, um, in workforce recruitment. So we've had a lot of successes over the years, but you know we, we do not wanna continue to do the same thing because while it's having some impact, it's not having as much impact as we would like. And so this is where I would like Michael to talk just briefly about the, the future of what we're looking at. And, and in, I think most important, I would say, is working with all of you who have an interest in this. And Michael is the point person. I am also very engaged, but um, I'll turn it over to him for what we're, what we're looking at for the future. Sure, so the, you know, I think the key here is that um, as a facility, we offer um, a, a number of places where we can touch the community. And so this is includes both a national and international community of users of the facility of the gauge facility. So this includes researchers, this includes undergraduate students, graduate students as well, but it also includes the general public who may have an interest in having access to data. Additionally, I'd note that this also includes some groups that can probably be strong partners that maybe we haven't traditionally thought of before. So we have collaborations with groups like the National Association of Geoscience Teachers and NESTA, the National Earth Science Teachers Association. These are groups that can certainly help us in terms of getting messaging out to the public. Um, and so as we work together, I think these are uh, certainly touch points into the community that we wanted to be continuing <clears throat> to focus our attention on and, and, and really trying to expand as much as we can. Um, we also have uh, uh, the capacity to play uh, a, a larger role probably in geodetic education systems. And this sort of stems from our unique positioning um, outside of sort of what would be considered the traditional education ecosystem. So 
we're sitting sort of parallel, uh, but in an in, in-between space to the, the academy where training is largely happening. So this gives us a chance to think flexibly uh, about how we might develop a, a, a geo, geo, geodetic workforce. And this could occur through a variety of different pathways. Some of this could be in the terms of maybe implementing new courses or curricular materials designed specifically for use in the academy. But it also may, may be focused on sort of short courses or um, modules that could be operated outside of the academy that would be specifically targeted at some of the ideas that have already come up, like we've heard mentioning about micro-credentialing or certificate programs. These would be sort of focused at a different level of workforce development that would be tied into sort of career changers, people who want to develop new skill sets that are already working in the field. And we see that from a number of the short courses that we're already running, uh, where we have a number of people who are coming back to sort of enhance their abilities to do this kind of work. And so we know that audience is out there um, and we should really, really can be thinking about how we want to really support them and maybe even create new pathways for them to go further with that. Sort of the third thing that I would mention here is that we have a lot, a robust um, set of expertise on staff, um, maybe that other facilities might not have. And I think we could do take advantage of this group. This includes instructional uh, and program designers, uh, workforce staff, as Donna already mentioned, uh, program managers and evaluation specialists, science communication specialists, uh, event planners, and others who are really, you know, po well positioned in order to, to create opportunities for the community to engage both with one another, but also to reach out to outside audiences. So um, how do we connect to teachers? These staff are already doing some of that work now, but are, and, are, and are well poised to be able to expand some of that those efforts and begin to make more inroads into uh, the educational community, for example, whether that's at the K-12 level or into the higher ed uh, levels that um, maybe aren't as familiar with geodesy as we'd like them to be. We also have an opportunity to take advantage of the programs that we've already been running. So we have a large uh, sets of, of alumni of our programs. This would include internship programs that we've been running for years. So we have students who've come up uh, done internship experiences and gone on to uh, pursue careers in geodesy, but it also includes participants who have come into our short courses, participated in those and had great learning experiences and been able to apply that learning to their ongoing work. These are people who could provide additional insights into what they need. They you know, haven't participated maybe for a year or two, but they're really close to where we're you know, offering things now and can really provide us sort of focus group type information that can help us shape what, um, what new resources need to be developed, new programs need to be developed and offered in the future. Um, and there's probably things that we're not already thinking of uh, that they have a unique insight into. Uh, and finally, I think the last thing that we would wanna to note here is that we have experience running a large number of large community workshops where we can bring large groups of people, often cross-disciplinary together and facilitate experiences for collaboration, uh, sharing of ideas, and really creating new visions for the future. And these can, these can range from a variety of things from thinking about, um, as pictured here, this was a workshop that was focused on bringing together early career geophysicists with early career geoscience education researchers and bringing those two communities together to identify new problems that maybe we wanna solve and thinking about creative ways to, to think about those problems. And for a variety of them, it was a way to create um, new content pathways um, and explore topics that would be uh, that were uh, sort of unique because neither one of them had the expertise solely themselves to solve those kinds of problems. And I think that this this situation that we're facing today is really one of those interdisciplinary problems that we want to be addressing sort of collaboratively by reaching out with our peers and other groups. Uh, and those peers may actually not even know that we exist uh, in terms of you know, what geodesy is. So there'll be some education on our part to just even get them in the door. But these are some of the exciting opportunities that I think that Earthscope is uniquely positioned with the Gage facility to offer to the community. And so we'd look forward, as Donna said, to working with everybody to sort of bring that together. And I'll just add as a last point, please, please reach out if you would like to talk more about any of the things that we've talked about today, or if you have ideas, because we would love to work with you. There you go, Matt. 
Thank you so much, Donna and Michael and all of our speakers. Um, I think we we made it through the time. <laughs> we're, we're a little bit over time, but I think that's great. Um, the chat is open. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. Um, as you guys are formulating your questions, I'll just say that I think that this webinar is just the start of a conversation on trying to get groups together. I've gotten, you know, we've had unprecedented interest in this topic. You know, we had over 130 people logged in today. I've received lots of emails and even some phone calls. People still calling me on the phone sometimes. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest in this, and I hope that we can use this to leverage uh, cross-disciplinary, cross-agency uh, communication, you know, on solving this this major wicked problem that we've got. And I think it's all hands on deck. Um, I'll just know that there'll be opportunities at AGU, at the AGU meeting uh, for us to discuss this, but feel free to send emails again to any of the speakers today um, uh, to, to move this forward. So with that, um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Does anyone uh, wanna raise their hand or unmute themselves to ask a question or make a comment? All right, I see somebody's unmuted themselves. Peter, do you have a well, Matt, this is, this is Dr. Marquillo. I'll just okay. chime in again, I think, real quickly, just maybe to stimulate some conversation. But again, I, I think I, I really want to highlight one of the things I touched base with at the end there, which is um, I, I think one of the major keys to addressing our challenges in geodesy is to address our challenges as a nation in terms of math overall. And again, I think this goes back to not only how do we teach geodesy and how do we make that awareness um, but also I think we really need to fundamentally rethink what are we doing um, because whether it's geodesy or anything else we increasingly see the U.S. is struggling as a whole in fundamental math and um, I think we need to have a broad conversation with our colleagues over on that side particularly on the k-12 uh, elements of how do we fundamentally teach math and how do we you know you get better at it over great great point all right uh, everett hinckley as first hand up and then we'll go with duncan yeah and uh i i wanted to echo that comment that you know i i think the problem is really deep and i i was uh, the author of the uh, article in ion in the ion newsletter last fall about the the geodesy crisis and i talked to a lot of people before i finished writing that article and it's very clear to me uh that um that STEM in schools is a fundamental part of the problem. Um, I went to Ohio State uh, through the uh, Geodetic Science and Surveying Program. Uh, I've worked at the Defense Mapping Agency and uh, the Forest Service as a photogrammetrist and mapping, surveying and so forth. And I would not consider myself a geodesist. I have a healthy respect for geodesy. I have a basic understanding of it, but when it comes to the to the math intensive part of it, I certainly could not go work for the National Geodetic Survey as a geodesist. I just don't have the, the math background for that. And uh, I remember when I went to Ohio State, the, uh, the chair of the department pulled in the domestic students and he said, why do you guys suck at math? And th that's like the, the main thing that I remember from going through that program. It was kind of startling to me at the time, but I knew he was right. So, you know, to me, the, the fundamental part of the problem is uh, getting students, first of all, getting them the STEM skills, the math skills, so that we can be competitive on a national and international basis, and, and then doing the marketing piece on getting students into geodesy. So with that, I will, I will uh, lower my hand and listen to the following comments. Great, no, thank you. And thank you so much for your article. Um, it was a great article. Um, Duncan, go ahead. Uh, Duncan, can you unmute yourself? I was having trouble with my mouse. Um, so I think there's lots of things to say, and but I want to point out that academically in the U.S., geodesy has never been very well represented. Um, the contrast with Germany has always been striking. I think there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is that the surveying community has not supported a lot of academic programs in the past. Um, many surveyors have tended to view what they do as more of a skilled trade. And so 
you know, there hasn't been a basis. For most of my career, if you said geodesy, my answer would be, oh, Ohio State, right? That was pretty much it. And that was largely DOD supported. Um, I'm actually going to send to Matt a uh, history of science paper on the history of the OSU program, which he can redistribute as he sees fit. But I just want to read you a couple of sentences from the, from the end. A reason for the partial success of the OSU geodetic science Sciences researchers is paradoxical. They succeeded too well. They formed in a critical moment in Cold War history organized to attempt the heroic goal of devising the modern figure of the earth. They reached that goal. Their achievement was one of the most important intellectual triumphs of the Cold War, but also perhaps the least apparent. The fruits of the figure of the earth are intangible and dispersed. They are distributed across society, embedded in a myriad of technologies resident in every map or GPS receiver. Once the figure of the Earth is ubiquitous, it becomes invisible. Over the Cold War, the members of the OSU's geosciences community positioned themselves with extraordinary precision along the Olentangy River, and in doing so, they made themselves all but disappear. And so I just offer that as historical, historical background, but I, I, you know, in the U.S., geodesy has never had, um, has never had a much of a presence in academia. Um, I will add that we see the same, I'm quite familiar with the same phenomenon in marine acoustics. Uh, they also both have the problem that for most of their careers, most of the time, the main user was the military. And if there's uneven funding there, then that fades into the educational program. So I'll shut up now. All right, thank you, Duncan. I look forward to just seeing that history. Um, I did see there's a question here that maybe some of you guys can address, which is um, this question of uh, a role for an, uh, an international workforce. Um, you know, there are some limitations with some of your agencies in terms of um, hiring uh, only U.S. citizens. But to what extent is there a role um, in your agencies or allied agencies in, in the geodetic uh, workforce in the United States for um foreign uh, nationals. Hey, Matt, well, the I'll silence call. is deafening, I think. But <laughs> um, I can't really speak for the others. I, I think really overall, though, I think there are some opportunities across the U.S. government in some instances for at a minimum folks who have what I would imagine is a green card or 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 those. Um, obviously, as I noted during my talk, from a perspective of both the DOD and the IC, it, the requirement to be a U.S. citizen is going to be pretty firm for some time to come for, I think, very understandable reasons. But I'll, I'll defer over to John and some others for maybe their input from a non-DOD side. Over. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words. Uh, you know, I'm since coming on, when when I came to Cores Branch, we we had five members, and since then, in the last three years, I I brought on uh, uh, five additional members, which uh, one is actually uh, uh, Rick Bennett, um, and and uh, now you you might have seen that I'm I'm in the process of of uh, advertising for a Cores Electronics Technician, but. Uh, uh, you know, federal rules dictate, you know, it, it's it's U.S. nationals that that can really take on these these federal jobs. So I'll. I'll, I'll so so maybe the, the best advice is try to get your U.S. citizenship if, if you're a, a non-U.S. citizen. All right, we had a uh, uh, Scott uh, Sponhorst, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, I guess you had a problem raising your hand. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add add a few pieces of detail about the community, the Jesse community of practice that uh, John mentioned earlier. You know, we we're forming this from a governmental agency side. You know, just to start with, we realize that it's a bigger problem than just government. It, it's it's academia. There's industry involved. But for right now, we're just initially starting this with the government agencies of NGA, NGS, USGS, and NASA 
trying to get together and just trying to wrap our own heads around this and see what we can what we can come up with. Then we are going to expand into the um, NSF and the National Academy of Sciences, and the rest of academia has to be a part of this as well. I just wanted to kind of add that in. Um, and I, I loved uh, Jeremy's Jeremy's thing of a GIC comedy. I just thought, hey, what about a a, a video competition, a video game competition on geodesy, because we all know video games are huge across the middle school and high school. You know, if there could be something you could create in a video game style and get that get that marketed, you know, once again, marketing is a, a, a key aspect of what we do. I just wanted to throw those uh, few few additional details out there. That's it. And I'm from NGA as well. I'm, I'm from NGA along with Nikki in the Office of Geomatics. Thanks so much, Scott, for uh, sharing that. Hey, Matt, if I can, um, and I know this conversation, this is Dr. Marquio, I, I know the conversation has been focused obviously on the United States, but I would also note that of recent late, the United Nations have stood up a international center for geodesy in Bonn. And uh, Mr. Nick Brown, formerly of Geosciences Australia, has the honor of being the director of that. And in speaking with Nick and a number of the folks there, uh, one of the very two first, I think, key priorities is this crisis in geodesy as a whole. So uh, while it may not necessarily be a per se job at the DOD or a job over at NGS, uh, the, at the end of the day, geodesy is, is a global game. I mean, no one country can do it all by themselves because you've got to have geodetic infrastructure around the world to collect the necessary data. So I, I think there are, I would submit, that I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to think creatively about how can we leverage that UN center? How can we augment what they're doing? And how can we treat this as a global game? And I, I think at the, end, at the end of the day, if we get someone over in, I, I always use the mythical country of Albonia, just because it's uh, generic, but if we can get somebody in, in Albonia or Blickenstein equally, you know, behind the wheel of a, of a VLBI antenna or doing gravity measurements or magnetic measurements or standing up a center there, that's going to be just as valuable as having someone who comes to work for NGA or NGS. Over. Great. Um, I don't know if you guys can see in the chat a uh, question from Kimber, uh, which is sort of along the lines of, you know, there are some MS and PhD students uh, with degrees in geodesy who are still looking for work and uh, are having some challenges in finding work that's using their geodetic skills. And so I don't know if you have some generic advice you can offer uh, to such folks. Can I speak up? Yes, go ahead. Actually, I hired uh, uh, Kimber, and I actually, you know, st stole her from from uh, Unavco Earthscope, and 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 maybe it's I don't think it's so much a a, a question uh, from her, but more a comment. And 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 maybe if we could allow uh, Kimber, Kimber, I, I I I love what you have to say. Maybe you can, you know, instead of people can read your comment, but maybe I know you're a good speaker, so better than me. Do you want to come off mute and share your feelings? And if not, that's all right. Yeah, so I guess, uh, Kimber is welcome to unmute if you would like to, but I guess, um, Donna, why don't you go ahead? Hey, can sorry. I, I, oh, okay. sorry, go ahead. Kim, Kimber, go ahead and then I'll just jump in because I have a comment that's related to your post. Thanks. Hi, by the way. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm on my phone because the government doesn't allow Zoom, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my comment would just be, I, I see the focus on let's get students, let's entice students, let's have them take math, let's do all of that. And as someone who had a very early interest in geodesy and has wanted to learn and wanted to become a geodesist and wanted to help grow geodesy in America, it has been incredibly hard how to figure out how to do that. And, 
And what I find myself doing is metadata management and updating websites and sorting equipment because there isn't a role for someone to use their brain in geodesy really right now. And um, it, it's been pretty disappointing on a whole. And I do hear I have, you know, I worked with a lot of students from China who would love to stay in the country and work on geodesy. Um, but because there aren't professorships available and there aren't government avenues for that, um, they end up going back to China. Um, and sometimes they don't want to. So I would just say, you know, I fully support this, like this push and increasing geodesy and awareness and getting more people involved. I think that's all wonderful and great, but I think it's, I, I don't think a lot of early career geodesists have been involved in this discussion yet. And I think instead of starting with, let's get as many students we want as we can interested and involved, it should be a little bit more of what should we do with the ones that we have now? We have qualified geodesists who aren't strictly doing geodesy. I know a lot of the geodetic researches div division at, at, NGS is doing a lot of maintenance work and programming work. Um, so why don't we start with the geodesists we do have and let's use those skills that we train them on. Um, and then once we kind of have that developed, then start adding new interest. But the interest is there. I really don't think that's, that's the problem in this workflow. I think the problem is you know, those of us who do have interest and do go through programs have nowhere to go. So there's no point in raising a bunch of interest if it's just a dead end. Great, thank you so much for sharing that, Kimber. Donna, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, Kimber, thank you for, for saying that. And I think that this is a really important point is that we we really need to understand kind of where we're at with baseline data and 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 do how many people do we have that are looking for other opportunities and i think that you know i'm looking at the 100 plus people that are on this call and and i think that a lot of this is also related to kind of this kind of conversation and connections and networking and helping people um understand what the what opportunities are out there and available and so i think matt you know you're bringing this group together is really kind of the first step in addressing what what kimber is is pointing out in in my opinion All right, um, Andrew, you have your hand up. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, still can't hear you. I see your lips moving, but oh, there uh, we go. I, I, there was a pop up. I, I had to approve my unmuting uh, from the host. So thank you. Uh, this ties into what Kimber has brought up. I just want to ask, and maybe there are some people here that are in the know about this. What is it that China and India are doing that we should be doing? If they're hiring these geodesists, then that means they're putting money toward this geodesist. They have some goal in mind. So does anyone have any insight as to what they're doing that we need to be doing here in the United States to get some money into this and to actually get some positions open and take advantage of these people that Kimber are talking about that just aren't finding the jobs they would like? All right, uh, Everett, I see your hand is up. You want to answer that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's... That's kind of a difficult question, and yet it's not. Um, I see these other countries, like China in particular, is working very, very hard at building out their geospatial capabilities. They have the Baidu system, which is actually more advanced than our GPS system, which I hate to admit that, but it, but it is. And so they've been working very hard at developing their geospatial capabilities over many years and probably many decades. And the same is true in other countries. And I think also, you know, I, I look at the way that I did math in school and the way that I was trained to do math. And then I look at some of the foreign students that are in school with my, with my children. And I see a, a real difference in the way they approach homework and, and math and things like that. So I think that there's sort of a different dynamic in those countries in terms of the of the approach to schooling that we don't have here um that disappoints me as a parent and as you know as an american 
but um, but I do think that there's a lot more opportunities um, in places like China and other countries um, on the other side of the globe when it comes to geospatial capabilities. And I think that that's where the people are going with those degrees that are being churned out of their universities and our universities. Well, that I, a quick follow-up. You mentioned Beidou and, and we're talking about India as well, so Navic as well. Once Beidou and Navic are built out and become established in the way that GPS is established, do you think that their geodesy workforce is going to see uh, a drastic decline? I mean, is this just a project-based, well, it might be a decades-long project, but is this just project-based employment or are they just going to establish themselves as the new leaders in the geodetic workforce? Um, I, I think their their approach is is from a project perspective. So it's it's likely that there's going to be a tail off in the need for those those skill sets. Um, I'm also a member of the National Coordination Office for Positioning, Navigation, and Timing, which is the GPS.gov group. And one of the things that at all the meetings that um, where we give presentations, one of the lead slides is always that we want to maintain our premier position in in GNSS around the world. And I'm not sure that we can do that, you know, with the, with the stiff competition that we're getting from other countries. So that was sort of an aside there, but anyway. Yeah, Matt, a couple of quick comments I would make would be that um, twofold, I think really first and foremost, yes. And it was a quote there out of the, the, the OSU history, which was that we kind of became victims of our own success. Um, and I, I think, though, that we're kind of at an inflection point in our history as, as geodesists where uh, that we've ridden on those coattails for a long time. And now we're faced with the next generation of accuracy that's coming for many of those things that I mentioned and noted uh, back in my, my briefing and more. Um, I think we're going to have to take a look see at really what is the need. And that's one of the things that I know the National Academy is is standing up to look at in this next calendar year, uh, that what is first and foremost, what does that, that next generation look like um, in terms of accuracy and requirements and needs? And there is a real need to the other comment there of what is the demand signal? Um, and I would encourage many who are on here as the National Academy reaches out for that survey um, to participate because we truly do need to capture what that demand signal is. But my second comment really, I think, is, is that overall, I think the, and this is not just limited to geodesy, I, I think the notion anymore that you are this, whether it's a geodesist or a computer programmer or all of that gets jumbled together anymore. And so the notion that you're going to be doing geodesy and nothing but geodesy, there may be a few that get to do that. But I think overall, at the end of the day, you wind up being multidisciplinary. So if we look for just example with the explosion of small sats, I mean, we're looking right now, I, the numbers I've seen is that the commercial sector is going to have upwards of like 6,000 sensors and over 3,000 imagery birds that are going to be up there. You know, how do we do that at scale? How do we mosaic together when 75 birds take a shot? Do we do we bundle adjustment and pull that together and then treat it as a image? Or do we treat it as 75 different images? And, and then how do we deal with it if it's multiple constellations? How do we deal with all of the error propagation? You know, these, these are the kinds of issues which may not be necessarily pure geodesy per se, but if we start looking at the broader aspects of where geodesy impacts and playing into those those uh, programs and efforts, I think that's really is where the demand signal in the larger sense of those thousands that was in the, the crisis for geodesy white paper starts to come into play. Over. Great. Uh, well, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, there's still can suggestions and questions coming in the chat. Um, uh, and I appreciate that we are a little bit over time, but I guess I wonder if anyone has a question, uh, as, as a direct question I see in here is um, from Joomla, uh, which is, can anyone comment on job opportunities in the private sector for geodesy trained scientists and engineers? I don't know if anyone on the panel uh, wants to try to take that.
All right, go for it, John. Matt, I mean, I'll I'll address maybe a, a tip of the 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 iceberg on that. When I alluded to uh, uh, mentioned about the the contract, we 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 recently approved the contract to build foundation cores. I, I, I'm. It's just an example. Maybe the trickle down effects. It goes to uh, 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 private companies that that hire the the people the 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 earth scientists necessary to evaluate site geology, look at uh, data integrity and and such. So so that's just an example. Again, maybe from the federal side, the trickle down effect. If we can pump money uh, through contracts and, and into the community, I, I I think it will help the the Esri's and 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 such to to hire the these geodesy professionals. That's one way. That's the, the way I, I see at the moment. Great. Well, thank you, John. Um, I guess if, based on some comments I'm seeing in the chat and some direct messages I've gotten too, I think uh, I think a good outcome from this that uh, we'll take under advisement if we can do this is just helping to consolidate opportunities, both job opportunities and internship opportunities across various sectors um, to have sort of a, a one-stop shop for people to find these sort of things. And, you know, it's it's sometimes hard to, you know, we get various emails or you look at various different message boards with different types of things, but that maybe if we can, um, I don't know if it'll be on the AGU site or somewhere else, think about, you know, finding a clearinghouse. Again, you know, a lot of opportunities come through the Earthscope mailing list. That's another a great opportunity for that, but that's not the only uh, resource. So, um, that's definitely one idea that I've gotten out of this that I think we can try to implement in the, in the short term. But um, I think another thing is just continue to have conversations amongst the group here and um, think about other ways that we can work together um, on the on all the all the issues that came up here. All right. Any one else have a final word they would like to say. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for participating and sticking around. We've got 81 people still on after 90 minutes, so I, I consider that a uh, useful time spent. And again, I hope this is not the last time we can get uh, everyone here together. And so please, um, if you have ideas of speakers that could talk to this issue um, for future webinars or other ideas, um, feel free to share them with me and anyone else on the panel. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Matt, and thanks to everyone.